For Krima Media's policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is DA Shadow Minister for Basic Education, Bakolile Dada, to discuss the latest developments in the education sector. Mr. Nodada, your party, the Democratic Alliance, is calling um, for our basic education minister, Angie Mozeha, to institute an audit of all school nutrition programs, as you are suspecting that there are other programs that are in jeopardy following the recent crisis that we saw in KZN that left uh, around 30,000 learners without food. What are you hoping uh, the audit achieves? Look, first and foremost, it's important for us to understand that um, children that were left hungry in KZN and more recently in over 4,000 schools in the Eastern Cape depend on that one meal a day. Many of those children, you know, as parents form part of the 30 million South Africans who live under the poverty line, who are dependent on grants. And therefore, one of the incentives to get them to go to school and not drop out is the fact that they get a meal that is guaranteed for them. So it's important for us to be able to do a full audit of these uh, national school nutrition programs across all other provinces, so that we don't find ourselves in a KZN or Eastern Cape situation whereby children are left hungry, but to also ascertain how other provinces are actually rolling out the program in terms of making sure that there is now breakfast that is provided to children and lunch, because the program is supposed to ultimately expand to two meals a day to incentivize uh, you know, children that uh, come from poor households to get a meal at school, but also to keep them at school. So in order for us to ensure that none of the other programs are at jeopardy, we need to do a full audit of how they actually roll out the National School Nutrition Program, uh, which is a national program, by the way, headed by DBE, and funds are na na naturally transferred to provinces to facilitate a, a best mechanism. We are aware that some provinces use a centralized model. Some of them use a decentralized model. So we need to know what is a differentiated approach that best works for different provinces so that we are able to streamline and be able to track the children are getting enough portions of food, uh, food arriving on time, and ultimately food won't run out, or uh, in the case of the Eastern Cape, paying uh, supplies late, uh, and ultimately children going hungry. And you also believe that this type of crisis can only be avoided if those who are responsible for it are brought to book. You see, in South Africa, we've got a big problem. People mess up, um, they break the law, uh, they steal from poor children, and ultimately, there are no consequences for them. And I, I raise this very harshly with the department that it cannot be that this is just something that is being put by the way. As we speak today, the special investigative unit is investigating the issue in KZN. National Treasury is investigating the issue in KZN. The president is investigating the issue in KZN. And the auditor general is also investigating the issue in KZN. And ultimately, we must get timelines and outcomes of which heads will roll for those that made a mess up of this chaos that left children hungry. There's also an indication that um, somebody who's very close to uh, an official in the administration may have benefited from that tender. And ultimately, those people that are trying to steal uh, money meant for poor, hungry children uh, must be held accountable, poor to book, and we must see consequences for this instance. Similar case in the Eastern Cape, heads must roll for those that left children hungry in the over 4,000 schools in the Eastern Cape. And another issue that has been going on for years in KZN is the issue of uh, scholar transports. Has your party been following on the latest developments on this issue? When I initially started in this portfolio in 2020, there were about 121,000 children that were eligible for transport to be transported to school in KZN. And they had, that number has increased to over 160,000 as I speak to you. But provision is being made, further budget cuts are just put in place, yet those children are actually eligible for scholar transport, but they're not provided scholar transport. Let me give it to context to you. 19% of the children that qualify for scholar transport in KZN are not provided scholar transport. What is even worse is that 33% of the learners with special needs that are requiring scholar transport are not provided scholar transport in KZN. The department came to present to us yesterday on the issues of scholar transport, and it's important for them to address that because ultimately that contributes to children that don't go to school. They end up dropping out because they have to long, walk long uh, kilometers to school. And do you know what happens at the end of the day? Those poor rural, mostly rural children, ultimately join the youth not in education, employment or training, 
which is 4.2 million, and end up living a lifetime of poverty and unemployment. So we need to avoid some, you know, some basic things like this of, uh, you know, mishaps on scholar transport, mess up in school nutrition, which are incentives that actually bring children to our education. And so then they stay in school, they acquire some uh, sort of a skill and knowledge, and ultimately are able to go um, and further their studies, find a job, change the circumstances of their birth. It's a chain, it's a system. And once you break it down, you will end up with more and more people that are unemployed, youth. Seven out of 10 young people are unemployed in South Africa. They don't work. And ultimately, if you trace them, they would have dropped out along the way. They might have formed part of the youth, not in education, employment, or training. So it's important for the department to be able to budget thoroughly for the scholar transport in KZN to reduce the backlog that they have of 160,000 learners. The Department of Basic Education has been struggling uh, to get rid of pit latrine toilets in schools after numerous deadlines. We know now that the deadline is 2025. Tell us about your campaign uh, to end school pit latrines and its petition. The pit toilets issue is a very emotive one. I'm a father of a four-year-old son. And I recently visited the family of Langalam Viki, who was tragically found dead in a pit toilet in close to Dordrecht in the Eastern Cape. No parent should ever enjoy the pain of losing their child in a pit toilet. Especially the fact that they send their child to go get an education. And this government has turned our schools into graveyards rather than places of education. So that is why, um, as the DA, we have uh, started... Uh, litigation processes to go to the courts to compel the department to come up with a, a plan with specific timelines to eradicate and end pit toilets in our schools. I mean, they've moved and shifted the deadline three times over. They failed, in fact, to meet the deadline. Every president that has come into the scene in our democratic country has stated that they want to eradicate pit toilets from Mandela to Mbegi to Zuma and now Ramaphosa. And the, the deadline was ultimately shifted three times over. It's unacceptable. I mean, these are basic things um, that are supposed to be done. Our country is losing so much money to corruption, and the, the state and ministers are protected by VIP security that is costing over 2.9 billion rand. I mean, a basic pit latrine that could have been eradicated years ago is still existing, and you don't know when you send your child to a school whether they're going to come back at the end of the day. We've lost six children in the last 10 years to pit toilets. I mean, that should sink in to, to somebody who's governing this. So we're conducting oversight visits in the different provinces where pit latrines still exist. There's over 5,200 of them that still exist across the country. And we're going to build a compelling case for the courts to make a determination on when the, the government uh, should be able to really eradicate pit toilets and how much that will cost and hold them to that particular deadline um, so that we don't have to lose our children uh, in pit toilets and rather than sending them to school to get an education, end up being in a graveyard. And Mr. Nota, the DA has objections and concerns about the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill. Tell us about that and why you are accusing the ANC of, of trying to capture these hearings. We shouldn't be centralizing control into the department as an apartheid style, because that's what an apartheid government did. It said to you, you're going to study in Afrikaans, whether you like it or not. And today we have to give the power to a department that will tell you tomorrow whether which school you will be able to attend, what language of instruction you will be able to use in that particular school, and centralizing control into the hands of politicians and administrators that are known in our community. So it is schools, it is parents, it is communities that know what is best for their children. Those are the people that should determine what language and admission policies are at schools. This bill does not even take into consideration the, 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 the ups of home and the concerns of the schooling community. And you would have seen in COVID-19, a lot of us were forced to go and do online and blended learning. It doesn't even regulate that. It doesn't even deal with the real issues in the basic education sector, like I've mentioned, pit toilets crumbling infrastructure with as mud and as space to schools. It doesn't deal with the massive dropout rate that we have um, in our country. And ultimately, it's a bill that is just seeking to centralize control where tomorrow the department can tell a school which principal they are going to get. Tomorrow they can determine who gets a tender for the LTSM to be delivered in school. And ultimately, we see what happens when it comes to catered deployment com corruption um, in our country. And we should avoid that at all costs. The power should remain at a lower level rather than politicians determining and trying to capture our schools. 
uh, by centralizing control in the hands of the department. 81% of South African learners in grade four cannot read for meaning. And I remember your party when we were from the COVID days when children were, were learning from home, uh, online learning, while others couldn't even do so. Your party forced our government uh, through um, going to high court to make sure that that order will allow children to go back to school again. What do you think should be done uh, by our education now in dealing with this crisis of um, reading? No, I'm saying that if children can't read, they are doomed before they even begin. I mean, like I said, the minister and the DG have been telling us of how good they do in the department. But what I like about Pearl's results, it's not about what you tell us you're good at doing. It actually shows what you actually have been doing. And those outcomes show that there's a bloodbath of children who can't read for meaning. Eight out of 10 grade four children can't read for meaning. What is even worse is that 56% of grade six pupils can't read for meaning on a grade four test. So that should tell you that we've got a bloodbath of children who are going to end up not in the standards of being able to acquire a qualification at the end of the day, not being able to contribute to um, uh, accessing opportunity or economic opportunity at a later stage, um, and ultimately will end up in a lifetime of poverty and unemployment. That is simply what happens. When you get a bad quality education, you are doomed before you even begin. You, you are going to end up living a lifetime of poverty. That is almost a guarantee for your life. You've got a department that is, that's got a reading plan that is not con concluded, it is not funded, there is no specific catch-up plan that is funded in this country. Chile just mentioned a catch-up plan recently now of over 2.4 billion, if I'm not uh, incorrect. And other countries have got a catch-up plan. They've got a reading plan that is funded. The only place that's got a, a catch-up plan in this country is the Western Cape with a back-on-track catch-up plan worth 1.2 billion rare that has been announced. It is the only province that's got a money that is allocated to reading which is 111 million that is allocated to reading for meaning, particularly for Africans and Isikosa schools. So if we do not have a, a catch-up plan that is funded, if we do not have a reading plan that is funded, that has got a timeline specific on how to improve those outcomes, then it's pointless having uh, conversations around reading for meaning with this department because they're pretty much useless when they come to it. We've taken back children to 10 years ago. I mean... Levels of 2011 of reading for meaning. I mean, Minister Mochecha has been in this department for 14 years. She's completely failed. I mean, she's regressed our children to absolutely nothing. She's tired. You know, she's, I mean, in my frank opinion, she's not innovative. She'd rather be peaceful than do what is required in the department uh, for them to be able to achieve the meaningful outcomes of quality education for children, for them to be able to read for meaning, to have depth of knowledge and understanding. So it's ultimately up to us to be able to summon the minister and the DG and the department in its entirety to come and present a reading plan, a catch-up plan that is funded, that's got a budget for us with a specific timeline, and we must be able to hold them accountable to that. That is the least that we can do at this point in time, but in, in this juncture, I have no hope and, and belief that they'll be able to turn the situation around. So do you also feel that it's time maybe for the minister to go? The minister should have gone a long time ago. I mean, she's failed to eradicate pit toilets. Children are going hungry in schools. They are crumbling infrastructure in our schools. There's poor quality teaching. Teachers that are unqualified, uh, they're teaching subjects that they're not supposed to teach, failing uh, tests for the very same subjects that they teach. Uh, as we speak today, children are doomed before they even begin. Eight out of 10 grade four children can't read for meaning. 56% of grade six people can't read for meaning. The metric results outcomes are appalling every single year in terms of quality. What is more important to this department is quantity over quality. So ultimately, uh, I mean, she should have gone a long time ago. She's absolutely useless. I mean, our children, particularly in rural, poor communities, are the regressing every single day. In this country, if you've got money, you are bound to get better education. If you don't, you're doomed. You're going to be forced to be go to a bad public school because this government is forcing you to do that. And now they want to take more power from communities and parents that know what is best for their children, for them to destroy what is left, the little that is left that is functional in the basic education sector. So she definitely should go. There was the A Shadow Minister for Basic Education, Bakolina Notata, speaking to Krima Media's policy about the latest developments in the education sector.